Welcome to GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, the Going North Podcast, where authors from around the world help you realize that success is tangible. You'll leave with at least one new piece of inspiration or information to help you keep going north. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, known as the Going North Podcast, we got another super special, awesome human for you today, my friends, because my goodness, man, like the wonderful world of podcasting, the wonderful big small world of the internet, you get connected with all sorts of magical people. And I'd probably say this might be, uh, I guess, the third, fourth person that I've been connected with, maybe fifth person that I've connected with through the wonderful ebc the evolutionary business counts because today's superstar guest y'all that's right superstar guest hashtag fabulosity this wonderful lady right here spent more than 20 years in the field of diversity and inclusion as a facilitator consultant and international speaker and she's an expert with the masters focusing on bias awareness and assisting in the creation of healthy workplace communities using her signature methodology, the ABCs of inclusion and environmental scan, customized training and support over time that are all focused on increasing awareness, belonging and connection. And this wonderful lady right here is committed to fairness and a belonging and organizations turn to this wonderful lady when they are looking to build healthy work Plays, communities, and environments. So let's give it up for Miss AMS herself, Miss Anne Marie Shrouder. How you doing today, Anne Marie? I'm well, Dom. Thank you very much. How are you? Ah, uh, doing good. And I just realized you're Miss AM in the AM. This is good. All righty. <laughs> yeah, except my name has a little M, so technically, it's just AS. Technical. Aww. If we want to be technical, but yes. As they say, right? Let me stop. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, darn it, I opened a can of worms with this one. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> oh man. But yeah, but as you know, with all introductions, they don't involve worms, they involve diamonds. So am I filling in the cavities I may have missed out of the introduction? Um no. No, I am in Canada though. That's something I always like to mention. Yeah, but I think you hit the highlights. Thank you for asking. Ah, my pleasure indeed. From the great country of Canada. That's right. <laughs> That's right. In the magical area of Toronto, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right. Ah, yeah. And not left indeed. That's right. All the French. That's right. All the poutine. <laughs> All the <laughs> hockey. Maybe some good true maple syrup, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ah, yeah, that's right. So my goodness, my goodness, that's what I'm talking about. So my goodness, 20 plus years, two decades of the D and I. Goodness, that's right. That's right. Not the dice and the ice, but the diversity and inclusion. So what led you to become really a black belt on this topic was it like your upbringing or was it like a random discovery one day you had like a paul on his way to the damascus moment and the light hits you it's like ah i gotta be a diversity and inclusion trainer and get these companies to really acknowledge and be more inclusive to folks yeah i think it was a little bit of both to be honest you know i'm i'm biracial and so i have a sense of or have had a sense of not feeling belonging you know, for my whole life up until recently, as I chronicle in, in my book. But so I think that set the stage for an awareness of, of what it means not to belong and, um, and just, uh, you know, having it on my radar. I became a elementary school teacher in the late 90s. And at that time, I took a course um, at York University about inclusive education. And that was my first foray into the world of isms, you know, racism, sexism, all the isms professionally, you know, like I definitely have experience with some of those um, personally, but we talked about it, you know, through the lens of teaching and, and what 
what we as teachers wanted to do for kids in our classroom to help them, you know, to acknowledge who they are and what they're bringing to the space. And it was like, it was, that was my light bulb moment. That was the wow, wow, wow. So I took that course and made sure that I created an inclusive environment in my classroom. And I did that for five years. And then I did a master's and left teaching and then wanted to, you know, I thought, this can't just be important for kids. Like what happens when we leave school? Like what are companies doing about this? And, you know, they were already, it was already out there. And I thought, Dom, I really, I thought I was going to teach teachers. I thought I was going to do this work in the teaching realm because when I taught the school board that I, that I taught at here in Ontario, Peel, uh, they were doing this work when I was, was that when I was a teacher. And so I was, I was a co-facilitator facilitating for teachers at that time. Um, with their, they had the Peel School Board had an amazing document called "The Future We Want," which was ahead of its time um, then. And uh, so I thought I was going to teach teachers, but that didn't happen. And I ended up, you know, working with a lot of not for profits and and more and more corporate. So, yeah, a little bit of everything, a little bit of light bulb, a little bit of upbringing, a little bit of just, you know, the way things happen. And I love it. I really believe this is my my work uh, a little bit of light bulb a little bit of everything all right i like that one <laughs> there we go that's right a little bit of light bulb in your life that's right the light and it's kind of interesting too how well then again i guess that happens with a lot of us it's like you get that instant realization and it's like oh wow i think i really found the path i want to take or mm -hmm. heck even the path i may even want to create and then leave a trail behind folks to follow and it's like you think you're gonna do one thing it's like hey you know what i think i'm gonna be teaching teachers this but it's like nah i'm gonna be going to the corporate corporate um environments and help them develop and help create inclusive environments heck even before we even go any further you have a wonderful way of actually explaining the difference between diversity and inclusion which is probably my favorite so far so mind sharing that with the magical listener absolutely so um yeah, they're very, they're different and they work together. And because we see them together in the acronym, I think sometimes um, we go down a bit of a rabbit hole or, or we miss it. So the D is that the, the diversity is a fact. As soon as you have more than one person in a room, you have diversity and some of it we can see and some of it we can't see, right? It's all, all the things that make us who we are. Inclusion, however, is a feeling. And it's something, it's something that I believe we create so my theory about why this work is still, while we're still plugging away at this, you know, DNI has been around for, for decades. Why are we still having this conversation? Why haven't we come further? We have come some way for sure, but why haven't we come further? And I feel like it might have something to do with the fact that people might be trying to do inclusion and you don't do inclusion, you, you create inclusion. It's something that we create. So when I work with clients, my methodology is all about that that creation of an inclusive space and inclusive environment over time and everybody participates in that it's not one person's job it's not the ceo's job or the hr department's job or the dni vp's job or what whoever it's everybody's job we're all included in creating that space for each other so that's the difference and and because there's such a big difference between the d and the i you know we need diversity inclusion is how we create a space to value that diversity and it's in the creation of that space where that diversity the people that 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 we're that we're working with and 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 serving will will, will feel valued will feel acknowledged will be valued and acknowledged and will stick around yeah and so i always tell my clients that the i actually has to come before the d i think we should be calling it i and d but it's not as catchy um, because if we don't create those spaces, you can have, you can focus on diversity all you want, but it's not going to, you're not going to get the value out of it. You're not going to hear people's perspectives. You're not going to use people's perspectives and the people will not feel acknowledged and they, they may not stay. Yeah, you're so right. Cause when I got to that part of the book, I'm like, Oh, okay. That, that makes perfect sense. Cause you're so right. It's something, especially the inclusion piece of the D and I, cause you're so right. The 
the I and D, it's like, nah, I can't say ID around, because you'll be like, oh, you want my ID? <laughs> like, they probably saw corny folks like me coming, it's like, hey, hey, how's your company's ID coming along? What, you mean our wonderful logo or something? No, your inclusion and diversity. Oh, oh. That's uh, right. We, we don't, yeah, so you're so right. right about that, like, inclusion, something you have to actually really create, and you have to really have it sustainable because diversity you're right it's like you go in the room and especially nowadays it's like hey there's going to be different shades and different belief systems in there and well the honest truth is the shades of appear first and then a lot of our unconscious biases will probably come out first before we even hear the person speak Absolutely. and if you don't have that environment ready to actually embrace those differences then it's really all for naught so it's so Good that you mentioned that. It actually makes it a lot more clear for the folks who may be, I wouldn't say newer to the topic, but because it's kind of everywhere, to be honest. But for those who may want a more clear definition of why diversity and inclusion, because it's like, hey, you can be diverse all day. But it's like if you're in the back of the wall in the metaphorical party in the room to yourself and everybody else is in the center of the room enjoying themselves and a few people are not, then yeah, that's not, not really inclusive. Exactly, exactly. And we're hearing a lot more now about belonging. So you might see DIB, right? Diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And I love that addition because belonging feels more warm and fuzzy than inclusion, <laughs> right? I think when I, when I hear the word belonging, I feel like I feel a hug, right? So I think that's a nice addition. It brings in our heart. It brings in the fact that we want to connect with each other. And sometimes we see EDI, and the E is for equity, not money. We're not talking about money, not talking about, you know, that that type of equity or, or you know, equity in your home, but equity in terms of fairness. And, and we need that piece as well. So more and more we're seeing EDI. And that, of course, is important because we want to recognize that people are having different experiences and have different needs because of who they are. And recognizing that and incorporating that helps us to increase inclusion and belonging. Ah, uh, so I call dibs. All right, there we go. I like. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Capital D, capital I, capital B, little s. I've seen that dibs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Exactly. You're quick. It's good. <laughs> I like to bring some levity to this work. It's hard work, right? We're doing hard work with people confronting um, and dismantling biases and isms. And we need to have a little bit of levity. It's important, you know? Oh, yeah. Definitely important indeed. So, my goodness. So, in speaking of all these additional terms to the DNI, that <laughs> I, I don't think we'll get to LGBTQIA plus level, <laughs> but it looks like it might go that way. There's it actually might. a new term in your book book called othering which is the first ever heard about it so I'm, I'm learning new stuff every day so for those who have no idea what the heck that means mind sharing a bit more about that absolutely so othering capital o is the way we make someone else the other as in not like me as in different and usually with that less than i'm better than you i know right so when we think about diversity and our diverse identities there are groups that are that have social power we call those dominant groups right um the some of the ones that we can think of right away um whiteness male able-bodied right uh, having um able-bodied um, and neurotypical rather than neurodiverse so some of those are some of the main ones heterosexual versus lgbtq 2si plus so when we have those dominant identities, we have social power. And when we have non-dominant identities, right, people of color, blackness, females, um, LGBTQ2SI+, non-able-bodied and neurodiverse versus neurotypical, we're in non-dominant groups and we're, mar we're marginalized, so placed at the margins of society. And uh, because of the way the societies are created, right, not just because of who we are, but because of how societies have been created and pushed those identities to the margins and centered the other identities. And so othering is about that push, is about the us in the center versus you on the outside. And, and the treatment of people as other, as not as important, as not as valued, as not as valuable. That's what that, and it's a term that comes from um, 
ARAO work, anti-racism and anti-oppression. You hear that a lot in that, in that space, which is, you know, which is the, the cousin of DNI, maybe even the precursor to DNI. And, um, and I certainly, you know, I, I live in that space as well. We don't talk about ARAO in corporate spaces. They want, they, they, we use the term DNI in corporate spaces. But if you're talking about power, if you're talking about privilege, if you're talking about systems, that's, it's the same work, right? Different, sometimes different methodology or way of doing it, but it's, it, we're, we're, we're talking about creating spaces where people are valued for who they are. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right, indeed. Yeah, because it's an interesting time in, well, what interesting times we're living in now. And heck, even your background reminds me a bit of one of our past guests, Thomas Williams, who's also a biracial author and a speaker. And he actually mentions how it can be interesting to be both because sometimes you get in rooms and they may think you're white because of the whole light skin privilege thanks to the colorism that goes around yeah. and you can and then he can basically be black in certain areas but <laughs> yeah. actually reading your book you actually went through something that i kind of went through a little bit myself is the fact that when you're well spoken they assume that you're talking white or that you're actually white because you speak well and the sad thing about the programming and a lot of the black community from years ago and hopefully still isn't going on around as much as the fact that proper English is not basically impaired up with blackness. They think that if a person is black and they speak extremely well, then in their articulate, that they're basically white and not black. So my goodness. So growing up with stuff like that, any advice for those who may be listening right now, who also may be biracial and may be going through similar things like that oh wow advice well you know uh, hmm. advice would be you know from this new place that i found myself in just in the last few years of both and rather than the place of either or right i spent my whole life you know not black enough for the black kids and and not white definitely not white because i'm because i'm brown right <laughs> mm -hmm. so visually i'm not white do i do i do I know how to navigate white space? Absolutely. Do I fit into white space because of, you know, to your point, how I speak and, and my cultural in intel from where I grew up and the people that I've been around? Yes, I do. And so for me, that was, a, was an either or us and them, you know, not this, not that, and, and not finding a place to land. And I think that's a, I would imagine that that's a very common experience for folks who are biracial, depending on where we grow up and, and our families of origin. I'm not saying everybody that's biracial is having this experience, but, but if you are having this experience as somebody who's biracial, what I found, and so maybe not advice, but maybe insight would be that I have, I have landed in a place of both and because I've spent my entire life wanting to be more black, wanting to be less white, you know, wanting to be something that I'm not. And so, and that's painful. And so where I've landed in the last few years which, you know, which has allowed me to write this book, which I talk about a little bit at the end of the book, is this really healing place of, I'm not black or white, but I'm both. I'm black and white. You know, I don't have to be either or. I'm both, both by virtue of my, my parents and, and my, my families, you know, my extended families. Of, and, I, and I hold that. In, and in the same vein, I'm me. You know, I have a, I have a different perspective on the world because I'm biracial, because I'm not black and I'm not white, but I have, but I'm both. And I'm, I'm learning to embrace that. I, I'm, I'm learning to embrace that in the work that I do. I think I do this work through that energy in a, in a slightly different way than somebody else might do it in either or, in the either or of those two extremes. So I think, you know, insights for folks who are biracial, I think we have an important place in conversations about race because we do walk with some privilege and we do walk with some marginalization. And in my opinion, the conversations that we need to start having about race are those both and conversations. And I like to, if you could see me, you'd see me cupping my hands together in front, right? 
we, we all have our work to do, right? As folks who are white, as folks who are black, as folks of color. And we also need to come together and share those stories and, and learn from each other and heal as we move forward in a different way. So I think folks that are biracial have a spot in those discussions that are really important because we can see things from both sides. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if they could say that again, especially with the <laughs> wonderful DNA that you carry with all the generations of two <laughs> wonderful backgrounds. It's like you care. It's like two whole generations here. It's got the, the mom on one end all the way from Austria. And then you got the wonderful okay. dad who's Jamaican. So it's like, ah, oh, so it's Jamaican roots all the way. Some European roots all together. It's like, ah, oh, man, like, that's a lot to carry. <laughs> It is. I mean, and we're all carrying that, right? We're carrying our ancestors um, with us. But, but I, you know, for me, it's really been a journey of recognizing all of them, right? All of that, not one side in favor of the other, not the other side in favor, right? But just, just the collective, what it means to have all of those ancestors behind me, with me. It's a beautiful thing. Aww. Ah, uh, yeah. And I, I just gonna... read, sorry, Don, can I say one more thing? I just oh, read, yeah. I just read in the, I can't remember where, that the new U.S. census has a larger percent of folks, we use the term racialized in Canada, but a larger percent of people of color. And their, their theory is that it's mostly biracial folks that's creating that upswing. And right, so we're seeing more and more of, of biracial identity because of you know, how we're moving around the world and how we're, you know, living together and, and meeting, you know, people across culture, across, across boundaries that used to be quite clear when we weren't traveling, you know, way back, <laughs> right? <laughs> people weren't moving around as much. So now we're moving around more. And it's, it's curious to me. It's interesting to me, like, as we, as we mix more, how the conversation will change and what conversation we'll have to have because of this both and so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Oh, yeah. Lots of fusion, lots of mixing, y'all. That's right. Folks going to be like, yeah, you biracial, I'm multiracial, fam. I got three of them. Nah, I got five of them. That's right, y'all. That's right, indeed. Although it's out there already. It's just probably not as publicized because folks be like, nah, fam, I can't say all that all the time. Be have folks confused to be like, huh? You got all that? And then if they speak five languages too, woo, they are forced to be reckoned with. Make them a prime minister or something. <laughs> or at least a darn good in <laughs> interpreter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. You'll, you'll be like a metaphorical chameleon in a good way. That's right. Mm. That's right, mm -hmm. indeed. That's right, indeed. Heck, you ever, I'm guessing you ever felt like a chameleon? <laughs> Mm, I've never used that metaphor, Dom, but let me, yeah, maybe chameleons change their colors. So no, <laughs> no in the changing color department, but the ability to sort of blend in different spaces, uh, sometimes, sometimes, and, and sadly for me, in my experience, maybe sadly isn't the right word, but in my experience, I've had an easier time blending in, in white spaces than in black spaces. Well, I got you. I got mm -hmm. you. Reading the book. I, just, I can understand why. It's like dad was the breadwinner and doing all the work and mostly having hallway type conversations because he was always working extremely hard to keep the food on the table. So, That's you know, right. yeah, mm -hmm. and being in areas where there's so little, you know, black folks. So it's like, yeah. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Yeah, and that was that was painful. That was very painful, and and continues to be painful to me. Right? I feel like there's a lot I missed, a lot I continue to miss. So yeah. Ah, uh, but hey, the good news is you still got a lot of life left in you. So there's some stuff to explore in the future, maybe. Absolutely, yeah, and and you know, this being in the space of both and has given me some freedom to to be in spaces that I may not otherwise have felt like I would be welcome in or could be welcome in or feel comfortable in. So yeah, I think you know uh, there is a part of the belonging conversation that is internal. Right? 
that when we feel a sense of belonging, then we move in that space differently. And it may not be what other people are saying or doing. It may just be how we feel about that space. And so, you know, my part in this journey is also about, yeah, I, I, I belong in those spaces. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in those spaces and be in those spaces and be open, you know, to receive and to feel and to connect. So there's that barrier that I have to bring down in my own self that's, you know, that's been created over time. Ah, that's right. They have walls indeed and walls indeed. Oh, yeah. So with all of this stuff going through all of that, the barriers, the internal barriers and some of the painful stuff you had to endure and probably still have to endure, you're able to become a poet. So did that happen to you when you're like eight or 11 or something and you just decided <laughs> to keep it going as a way to creatively express yourself? No, it didn't happen as a, as a kid. It happened as an adult. I was in my, let me think now. I was in my thirties. So quite a while ago. Um, and it just, it just, it just happened it just started I would I would and and I I believe that it was so poetry for me is the way that I that I that I feel my heart the most it's the way that I can express my heart the most and and poems usually arrive and that's that might sound a little bit um woo woo but and I know lots of authors say right the the character showed up for the story or you know the story just came to me it was a download, whatever the word is that you want to use, but those poems come like, like that. And if I don't have a piece of paper, they're gone. Like I can't remember them. Right. So what I use and, and what often happens is I get them when I'm outside. So I used to have a dog um, several years ago and I would take, and I live in Toronto near the lake. So we would go walking by the lake really early in the morning um, or in the, you know, somewhere in nature, not around the city. Right. Um, I love being out in, in nature, in the woods and stuff. And I, I learned pretty quickly that I needed to carry a paper and pen with me on those walks because that's when it would happen. And if I didn't write it down, you know, and it was usually a pencil because, you know, pens in the wintertime, they don't work as well when you're outside in minus whatever degree weather. Ouch. Yeah. So, so that's, those were, and they were messages for me. They were messages that helped me with what I was dealing with at the time with, you know, you know, pain or joy or whatever, usually something that I was trying to work out. And so that was a beautiful thing for me because they helped me in the moment. And I, I put them in the book because like I said, they were the, they're the, the, the fastest way to the, to the heart of what I'm trying to talk about. And I wanted to make sure that the book wasn't just a cerebral process that I engage people's hearts and that, um, that I really said what I wanted to say say you know not too flowery not too verbose just get to it get to the heart of the matter um so yeah it was an it was an an adult thing not a kid thing and and they don't happen as much anymore it was a period of my life where i was like i said out walking the dog i don't have a dog anymore maybe that has something to do with it um <laughs> i'm so thankful i'm so thankful for those nuggets of insight that helped me and i hope that they help folks understand from a heart space, what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate. Uh, so walk a dog, become a poet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It may not be that linear for other folks, but that was, that was my experience. Um, <laughs> Disclaimer, this may not happen for you, you know, <laughs> don't run out and get a dog now hoping to uh, become a poet. <laughs> uh, yeah especially with fall coming up <laughs> yeah. like yeah let me stay indoors if i want to be a curmudgeon when it's morning time when i can let me do it no the dog wants to go out no i want to go to come <laughs> darn it <laughs> uh, there are a lot i don't know what, how it is where you are but since covid um there are a lot more dogs in toronto and the shelters are empty so that's a good thing Oh, well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot oh, of people yeah. work from home looking for, you know, a furry companion, four legged furry companion, dogs and cats. Yeah, the shelters are, there's not a lot of animals to be found in the shelters up here. So that's good. It's a good thing. Oh, cool. That's what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. 
Yeah, because I know the lockdowns were a lot more intense for y'all up in Canada, I hear. <laughs> I think so, yeah. And, you know, I spent the winter in Barbados with my daughter and um, with her grandparents, and they sent animals to Canada from the shelters in Barbados. 200 plus dogs and cats were shipped up here because there was there's high demand for, <laughs> for pets oh. right now. Yeah, that's a little aside, totally off topic, but, you know. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I guess they needed some metaphorical weed because they were in high demand. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, indeed. That's interesting. So became a poet in your thirties as an adult, as one of those grown ups. That's what I'm talking about, indeed. So I guess since that was a phase in your life, you don't see yourself writing a full blown poetry book in the future. Hmm. Never say never, Dom. Never say never. I did have a moment where I thought I might pull all the poems out of this book and just create a little book of poetry because it tells its own story by itself. But yeah, I mean, I do have a couple. Haha, I do have a couple of you know homemade chat books we used to, we call them in the poetry world that I made when I was doing. I used to do a few open mics as a poet in my early thirties, so I did do a couple of homemade poetry books. Would I publish a book of poetry? You know, I don't know. We'll see. I'll let you know. <laughs> let you know if it uh, happens. Okay. All right. Yeah, we got to get you back on the show. That's right. And I could put on a koofy and some sunshades and then we just have an <laughs> open mic. It'll, it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. I look forward to it. <laughs> that's right. Have some incense in the background. Be like, yeah, that's right. Keep my pineal gland ready to be open. That's right. Mm. Uh, Amory's about to spit some balls, y'all. That's right. That's, that's <laughs> right. The poet, the poet's gonna spit, y'all. That's right. That's right, indeed. Heck, funny enough, you actually asked if you wanted to read a, if you wanted to read a poem. So, do you want to read a poem for the listeners to give them a taste of what to expect? Yeah, sure. That's Let right. Because I know you got the wonderful product placement back there, the magical PP right there. Magical, yes. The book. Um, well, you know, I opened it up to being colorblind. So let, I'll just read that one because I, I, I believe in these kind of, you know, nothing is a coincidence. So this is where I opened the book. So this is what I'll read. So this is with a section about being colorblind, which we talk a lot about, right? How could, you know, people like, I don't see color. Hmm, really? <laughs> I'm right here. I'm right in, what? <laughs> and, uh, and I talk about that a lot in workshops and I, and I talk about it from my own experience as something that my mother has said to me, you know, as a white woman, I don't see your color. So this is a very short poem <laughs> called mom said, mom said, I don't see your color. You said, I love you as if these can't coexist being and loving. And I wonder how can you love me if you don't see my brown skin? That was uh... short. There are others that are longer, but that's the taste. There you go. It's like licking some icing off a cupcake or licking some cream off an ice cream cone, y'all. That's right. That's right. A little taste, y'all. A little taste. That's right. That's a good thing about this book. Like, the poems aren't extremely long either. It's like a page. And they're just transitions to the next chapter, which is freaking fabulous. And also, the chapters are short, too. So this is definitely a fabulous <laughs> book you want to pick up. That's right. Pick it up. Heck, even if you want to do a workout, just buy 50 copies, you know, and try to put 25 on each arm, you know, so that way you can get a workout in. You'd be like, yeah, I'm going to get these metaphorical brown muscles going to tan myself by lifting these books up and down while I'm outside, you know. That's right, so I can be brown in the black and white world. Or if you're already chocolate like me, you'd be like, yeah, I think I'll be dark chocolate in a brown, dark brown in a black and white world. Yeah, that's yeah. right, indeed. Yes, indeed. So since this is far from your first rodeo, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often when you're on the guest side of the game on these podcasts? Oh, good question. Well, we've talked a little bit about the poetry. I like to I like to 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 share a little bit about why this book is not just a business book, you know, why it's both. So um, so if you're asking me to answer the question also that I want to be asked, then I will say that. This started out as a business book only, and it wasn't meant to be this book. This is this 
this is not the book that I meant to write. I was going to write about my methodology and um, do a little bit of, you know, teaching, right, in, in book form. And, uh, and consistently, the personal story was like, knock, 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 hello, <laughs> over here. This title has been with me for a long time. Um, and I, I thought it was going to be just a personal book, but but doing it together, first of all, it was terrifying. I think I, I do mention that at the beginning of the book. It was terrifying. I was like, oh boy, what am I doing? And it by the time I finished, it felt necessary. You know, I this is this is my story, and I do this work because of who I am. And so uh, in the end, you know, it, it, it's still terrifying, right? My personal story is out there alongside, you know, why we should do this as a, as a business imperative. I, I had a moment just before it was released. I'm like, no, take it back. Let's redo it. <laughs> I don't want to be out there like that. But I, I, I think it's important. You know, we're human beings. We have stories. We have pain. Racism is a huge pain. And I hope that I've written a book that allows people that don't experience racism from a personal standpoint of being impacted negatively by it, that to understand what those of us that are impacted negatively by it are feeling a little bit, you know, it's, it's one story of many stories. Um, so, so it's, it's a, it's a book designed to share my story. It has a business component for folks who, who are in business and want to take it there. But I think you could also just read the personal stuff and skip the business stuff if you're not, if that's not where you're going with it. So yeah, so thanks. Thanks for allowing me to, to dive in there. I hope it works. I hear it works for folks, the, the both, the both and. It's another example of both and, right? I couldn't just write a business book or a personal book. It had to be both. So it's true to who I am in the world. <laughs> ah, yeah, the genuine article. That's right. The leather jacket, not the pleather jacket. That's what I'm talking about indeed. Yeah. That's right, that genuine leather right there. Heck, even my favorite line I underlined from the book, heck, was from page 41, is that intention doesn't ease impact. Intention mm. doesn't ease impact. My goodness, powerful line right there. Heck, <laughs> any idea what may have inspired that line, even though you're probably in a different space when you're writing this? <laughs> no, well, that's a that's something I, I talk about very often in, in workshops and presentations. Um, it's about the fact that we may not intentionally mean to hurt someone, say something offensive, um, overlook, you know, overlook somebody. You know, in, in the world of DNI, we talk we have to talk about discrimination. So when we talk about it, we have to remember that it's not about the intention because we hear a lot from folks, it, it, I didn't mean to, um, it was a joke, I didn't realize, um, you know, and, the, and not saying people are making that up, it's, it's, you know, largely true, right? The challenge is that we are living in our own body and our own skin and we see things from that perspective. And so sometimes when we say or do things, it has a totally different impact on the other person that we don't know, didn't realize, right? May not even know about unless the person tells us. When we do DNI work, when we're, when we're talking about inclusion, we have to remember that it's the impact on the person that we have to look at and heal and resolve and address, not the intention. Because if I can be like, but didn't mean it, then what happened? <laughs> what happens to the person who was impacted by it? We miss that completely. And, and often when we say things like it was a joke, I didn't mean it, I, you know, it was unintentional. I'm sorry. Great. Yes, we want to hear, we, we, we want to acknowledge that it wasn't on purpose, but we have to acknowledge the impact on somebody because there is an impact. That's the work that we need to do. How did that feel? What happened when you heard that? What, what was the impact when that happened to you? Because unpacking and understanding that is how we move forward to create inclusive spaces so that it doesn't happen again. So that people can, can feel safer in the spaces that they work and live in. So we acknowledge intention. You know, it's, it's 
definitely different if you mean it, if you mean to do it, right? Then if you don't mean to do it, there is a difference there. There is an important distinction. Yeah. And it's the impact we have to focus on and take care of. Oh, yeah. So I got to take care of it. That's right. That's right. Care bear swag. Got to take care of it. Indeed. Yeah, it's a dig. It's so darn right. It's like, oh, crap, didn't mean it. My bad. Sorry. It was a joke. It was a joke. My bad. Yeah. I'm, I'm, but in all seriousness, oh, you're so, so right about that because, um, yeah, like uh, there, there's some people who don't know certain things. Like they may be, I guess, let's say in a different generation and in this day and age where sometimes you have to really, if not all the time, sometimes be on your toes. You have to be on 12 out of 10 of your toes when you say something because a lot of folks will try to spin it in a direction to where it's completely off base. And sometimes it can be really spot on nowadays where it's now offensive. You just have to be careful of the things that you say and things that you do so that way you don't unintentionally hurt somebody or just make them feel bad because that's definitely something we don't want to do especially nowadays where we we got we're at the wall the whole world's going through enough pain as it is already we don't need to add any more weight on top of it yeah absolutely and and there's going to be things we do and say that impact other people negatively without us realizing yeah because mm -hmm. again we're very we're intimately connected and aware of our own reality and, and how could we be intimately connected and aware of another person's reality? They're walking in the world in a very different way, right? Because of visible diversity, because of invisible diversity, because of experience, trauma, all that stuff. And so for me, a really important part of this work is awareness, right? That's the A in my ABCs of inclusion, one of the A's. We need to be aware that we are experiencing the world differently. It doesn't mean you're going to know all the different ways that people are experiencing the world. That's impossible, right? But we need to understand that there is going to be difference. And so you're going to invariably, we're all going to have an experience where we say or do something that impacts somebody. And we're like, uh oh, my, what? I didn't, I, I had no idea. My bad. But like, really, I'm so sorry, right? Because I had no idea. And, and that having no idea is an, is an important part of this work. To, to, to recognize and remember because there's always gonna be something we don't know. Don't know, can't know, won't know because of who we are in the world. There's, a, there's two um, educators and uh, medical professionals in California whose names escape me right now, unfortunately, um, but who have coined the term cultural humility. Knowing that there's gonna be things you don't know, won't know, can't know, that's okay. We're, we can't know everything, right? I, as a woman, I'm not going to know what's like, what life is like as a man. I can't. I walk through the world in a female body. That's my experience, right? It, when we can do that with all the different identities. Um, but, we, but when we recognize that there's things that we don't know and we walk through the world with humility, then when we bump up against a situation like this where we have impacted somebody because of something we said or did or didn't say or didn't do, right, we can take a moment and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, tell me more, right? Tell me more, like, like, help me to understand. And it might not be from that individual at that moment, because that might not be appropriate, or they may not want to talk about it. But it's an opportunity for us to learn more about the things we don't know, to help us create more inclusive spaces going forward, right? So I'm not going to say that again. But I also understand how it was hurtful, right? Why it was hurtful. So you know, we're, we're going to put our foot in it, guaranteed, as we move through the through our through our life. So there's some humility and some and some openness and open to connect and open to repair that we all need to step into. Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's what I'm talking about indeed. Yes, ma'am, indeed. Well, we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. And that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time in the current year of 2021, with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Oh, easy. I would say embrace all of who you are. I would say recognize that 
it's not about being less than it's about standing in in what you know and valuing your unique perspective and doing something with that um and years ago one of my coaches said to me if you're walking on a path if you're walking on a trail it's not your path because you got to make your own i would want to know that at 25. ah boom there we go that's that self-awareness baby she ain't even take long with that response <laughs> She didn't even take long at all. She's like, I knows myself. That's right. That's right indeed. That's right indeed. That's right. Embrace yourself. That's right. No matter what the skin tone is, no matter what your religion is, it don't matter. If you human, you matter, darn it. You matter. Embrace all of yourself. Always grow professionally, personally. Keep growing. Help other people. You got this. You got this. That's right. And if it pisses other people off, then that's their problem. That's their problem indeed. That's their problem indeed. And if not, then you can always call on Amory to help fix it if it's uh, one of those diversity inclusion <laughs> topics. And, of course, the belonging. So for those who need to call dibs on Anne Marie and hire for a bunch of keynotes and trainings, what's the best way for folks to do so? That's where for folks to find me is on my website, which is my name, annemarieschrouder.com. Do you want me to spell it? <laughs> no, nah, you don't have to. We don't do that here. <laughs> I understand why people do it, but no. <laughs> it's going to be in the show. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's where folks can find me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's right. Well, there you have it, folks. Head over to AnneMarieShrouder.com. Buy some copies of her magical book. Oh, out of curiosity, you're going to read your book anytime in the future? Put it on an audio book form for the folks who are blind or folks yes. who are Yes, yes. It's on my list of things to do. Um, I, have a, I have a colleague who does that for a living, and so, yes, definitely. How could oh. I not, talking about D&I and not make an audio book? No. Ah, okay. Here we go. So, is your friend reading it, or are you reading it? You know, I would. I we haven't gotten there yet. I would. I would love to read it. I know there's there's um, folks that say that's not a good idea um, for various reasons. I'm I'm listening to one now that is read by the author, and I kind of like that it's the author reading their own book. So I would, you know, I I'll push for that. We'll see what the final decision is. Yeah, I would like to read it myself. We'll see. Boy, you got a great voice. Read it yourself. Thank you. Well, okay. Well, I'll I'll add that to my my uh, arguments when we get when we get to that spot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Read it yourself. Try not to have caffeine so you don't talk too fast, and set aside a good fifty hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> in a quiet space, right? <laughs> That's not easy with a nine-year-old in the house. <laughs> That's right. If you screw something up, just keep read. Just read it over again and keep reading. <laughs> How real can I be while I do the audiobook? Mom, you know, background. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but thank you for asking that. It's definitely on my radar, and and it's um it's gonna happen. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Gonna cover all the bases, y'all. That's right. She's got you covered like a blanket. So any parting words before we close up shop, Anne Marie? Parting words. Um, besides thank you for having me. Um, I think that uh DNI is something that we all need to be embracing in various aspects of our lives, not just in business, but in our family, in our communities, in our schools. It's important work. How's it going, my friend? I'm glad you made it to the end. That shows that you really enjoyed what you heard and you are an uncommon finisher. Thanks for giving this show a listen. If you really want to help out the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with someone that you care about or someone that needs to hear this message because you want to spread this podcast around like butter on bread if that's your type of thing and if it's not your type of thing still spread it around anyway because good stuff needs to be shared with good people like yourself <laughs>